because there have been many throughout history, and uh, we'll try to, of course, we'll focus on on the one that uh, that exploded in 2008. But uh, the idea is that we should try to learn lessons for the future and uh, look both both behind us and look forward to the future. So we have two speakers on this session. Uh, it's uh, and the first one is uh, Torsten Beck, uh, Professor of Banking and Finance at the uh, Cars Business School in London and uh, Professor of Economics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And uh, you are here and you are ready. So uh, I know that I've, I've seen your articles on uh, Vox EU and so on and uh, you're very interesting uh, in the debate about uh, the financial system and uh, I really look forward to hear you speak here today. Thank you for coming. Welcome. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, so let me see what this yes, does. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, if you're looking for a more optimistic uh, out view outlook uh, this afternoon, uh, I might disappoint you. I'm afraid. Um, I don't want to see myself as a pessimist. I'd rather see myself as a realist. Um, um, now, I was also um, well, actually one more remark I want to make is that, uh, of course, the, the way a conference program is uh, structured. Um, might give, of course, a certain tone to the discussion. I remember a couple of uh, months ago, I was in, uh, at a conference by the National Bank of Poland, and uh, their theme was uh, three unions in the making. We were talking about a fiscal, the banking, and a political union. And they're trying to give it, a, of course, a positive spin by talking about making of unions rather than talking about crises. Um, although I guess the content uh, in the discussions was, was somewhat similar um, uh, um, in, in Warsaw as we have it uh, today in, uh, here in Stockholm. Um, now I was asked by um, Andreas to um, talk a little bit more broadly about financial crises. Um, so I'm going to start out relatively broad, um, uh, talk about regulatory reform, uh, talk about cross-border banking and the need uh, for properly regulated. Um, however, at the end, um, uh, as most discussions among financial economists in Europe nowadays, uh, I will end up on the Eurozone crisis because, again, that's uh, where most of our discussions nowadays end up on, uh, unfortunately. Um, so in the wake of the first crisis, uh, if we talk about uh, the financial crises, uh, the global financial crisis, there was a, um, a push for all kind of regulatory reforms, a whole variety, um, and of course uh, Sweden as a um, member of the European Union has been as much affected by that as uh, other countries. Um, of course, the high, the, the, the kind of the high-level stuff, uh, the most important, uh, uh, most discussed part, the, the capital and liquidity requirements on the Basel III. Um, then a lot of discussions, um, with partly um, implementation or very early days of implementation, um, uh, the, the activity restrictions, um, and then ongoing discussions, uh, for example, on uh, on taxation, financial sector taxation. Um, now, one element. Um, it hasn't been really missing, but it has been somewhat, um, sometimes a little bit lost in the discussion, I think, is the resolution part. Um, and actually, if you uh, think about the uh, policy reaction in 2008, uh, there was a really a disconnect between how the reaction by central banks in monetary policy and the reaction of central banks or regulators in, uh, in, in how to resolve banks, um, uh, with a very concerted and immediate reaction in monetary policy and a much more um, kind of puzzled or uncertain and definitely not coordinated reaction in the area of, uh, of uh, how to address uh, failing banks. <clears throat> now, um, before I talk a little bit more, more about this, um, resolution um, is for me at a key point um, because uh, the important thing is that we do not really want to avoid bank failures. And maybe that's a little bit of a misunderstanding. So that's why also um, uh, some economists, like Martin Helwig, uh, like to say, well, just increase uh, capital requirements as much as possible, then you avoid bank failures and you have enough buffers. Well, maybe we don't want to avoid bank failures at any price uh, because failure is part of the market process. And of course, you can have peace on the graveyard, but maybe it's not as attractive. Um, the problem more with, uh, with uh, uh, bank failures is not the, the failure itself, but it's the repercussions for the rest of the financial system and for the real economy. And that's what we want to um, uh, focus on, uh, minimize these repercussions. And uh, I won't have much time um, to talk about this, but I mean, there is a critical difference between <coughs> banks, financial institutions, and other industries, for example, the car industry. Um, and I mean, that this, uh, this comparison is uh, kind of almost obvious because uh, we had similar 
uh, situations in the car industry and in the banking industry in, uh, in 2008, um, where of course the, the problem was, um, from solicit in Europe, there are too many car plans, um, whereas in banks, actually the opposite, there's not enough lending going on. Um, so there are, are critical differences between the banking system and other industries because the banking system kind of supports the rest of the economy, um, but also the interlinkages within the banking system make the failure of one bank much more um, exacerbated much more for the rest of the financial system than let's say if one car and car plant or sorry, one car company or one car supplier um, uh, goes, uh, goes belly up. Um, now if you want to put this into a little bit more um, uh, um, this descriptive, wor descriptive words on how this, uh, why bank figure is such a, a big problem, um, uh, you can talk about the do domino effect. If one bank falls then other banks fall because they all network with each other. You can talk about a hostage problem um, because depositors like to run if uh, they hear something is going wrong. And of course, um, uh, in Europe, we still had uh, um, uh, retail bank runs such as uh, Northern Rock in, uh, in the UK. But of course, the, the bank runs of today are much more in, either on the internet, such as for the Icelandic banks, um, or in the wholesale market, uh, where funding can dry up very quickly. And then there's what I call the fridge <coughs> problem. Um, it's a little bit like m when you take milk out of the um, uh, out of the fridge and let it stand outside, and especially in warm temperatures, then eventually you can't use it anymore. If a bank goes under, um, a lot of soft information about borrowers is being lost. So the, the borrower-lender relationship is also critical, especially for SMEs. It's getting lost once a, a, a bank goes under, um, and that of course has negative repercussions for um, uh, for the for the real economy. Um, and that might also be one of the reasons why recovery after financial crises, after recessions following a financial crisis, take much longer than typical recoveries after a, a normal uh, uh, recession, let's call it. Um, because of that critical role of banking, uh, because of these problems, we have this financial safety net um, and uh, deposit insurance, as most countries in Europe. We, of course, have the lender of last resort, the Riksbank or the, the, the ECB. Uh, we have supervision, but the part that was really missing in 2008 and is still missing in many countries and is definitely on the European level is the, is the resolution. How do we um, um, solve banks? Um, basically, without a proper resolution framework, you have two options. Um, this does it work? Yes. Um, this one here, where the, the, that's the southeast corner, um, you impose discipline, <coughs> you let the bank go bust. That's the Lehman Brothers model, if you want to call it like this. And we've seen what effect this had. Um, so you basically don't control for the repercussions of bank failure on the rest of the financial system and the real economy. Um, given what uh, policymakers saw happened after uh, Lehman Brothers, they made sure that there would not be another Lehman Brothers, and they went to the other extreme, which is basically bail them out. <coughs> Just throw money at the problem. What we are, and of course, that minimizes the externalities. That uh, um, helps uh, take care of the domino effect, for example. It, it reassures uh, depositors, especially if you give a uh, blanket deposit guarantee, and it also helps maintain banks as uh, a provider of liquidity, a provider of information, and so on. So it minimizes the externality of bank failure on the, um, uh, on the real economy if you don't let them allow to fail. But of course, there's no effect whatsoever on market discipline. I mean, you basically uh, reward people for taking aggressive risk, and of course, you create expectation for future uh, bailouts. What do we want? We want to have something in the middle, which uh, both imposes a certain degree of market discipline while at the same time uh, uh, minimizes the externalities. And I won't have time to talk much about this, but this is basically where the reform discussion goes into a model where, yes, um, uh, uh, discipline is imposed on shareholders, on junior debt holders, for example, while at the same time you maintain the critical parts of the bank, especially the, um, the, the, uh, the intermediation function for the, for the real economy. Um, now, that's only on the national level. Now, if you go from there to the cross-border level, so for cross-border banks, there are additional uh, kind of externalities coming up, and that is that um, um, national supervisors, like the Riksbank, um, of course, actually by law, not just because they like it, but by law, have to care about uh, financial stability in Sweden, about Swedish stakeholders, about Swedish depositors, Swedish equity holders maybe, um, and also the financial system in Sweden itself. Uh, not necessarily about uh, the repercussions of the failure of a Swedish bank, let's say, outside, um, outside Sweden if it has subsidiaries elsewhere. Um, and that can le lead to um, um, distorted decisions by bank supervisor. Now, you, you might argue that this is a very theoretical point I'm making here, but actually we did look at data for that. And uh, we looked at bank failures in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, 
and we found indeed that um, uh, the point of intervention of cross-border banks uh, varied according to whether it was more foreign owned, more domestic owned, or had more of its assets deposited outside or inside. And uh, basically, if a bank is more foreign owned, then uh, the, the national supervisors had actually an incentive to intervene more early, because allowing a bank to continue to work, let's basically let take foreigners the, take the benefit of it. Whereas if a bank has mostly uh, deposits and uh, assets outside the country, the cost of bank failure would actually fall outside the country, so you could actually allow a bank to just continue for longer on, to have more forbearance. And of course, there's some extreme examples like Iceland, which were definitely banks that were intervened too late. However, we call, uh, in addition to just um, that these direct um, linkages, these direct cross-border linkages, and of course this region here, the, the Scandinavian Baltic region, is one of the regions where we have these extremely close interlinkages among the countries, um, there are also indirect effects which um, where banking systems are interlinked with each other that don't go through direct links between banks but through exposure to the same markets. So you can think about the US and Europe um, um, being exposed to the same asset markets and if for example banks in the US have to sell rapidly assets then the price reduction also affects balance sheets in Europe that hold the same kind of assets. So independent of direct um, uh, interlinkages through exposure to the same markets there is an interdependence, and again, these effects are not being taken into account, for example, by the Federal Reserve uh, uh, when they make the intervention decisions. An additional point, and that brings, already gets me a little bit into the Eurozone uh, discussion, is of course within a monetary union you have these additional um, externalities um, uh, of uh, cross-border banking. Number one, um, as we know now, um, um, monetary and financial stability are very closely linked with each other. So yes, um, just looking at consumer price inflation is not enough if at the same time you have an asset price bubble as for example in Spain, Ireland, but also in the Netherlands. Um, if you give up the exchange rate as a policy tool to adjust um, um, to shocks or to, uh, to, um, to adapt to, shock, to shocks, um, that puts an additional uh, pressure on other policy measures within uh, policy tools within the monetary union and uh, maybe most importantly and it's something we, we've been observing in the eurozone is that if you have a common lender of last resort um, like the ECB um, you have the incentive of national governments to basically tap this common pool um, and not intervene into failing banks but rather try to taper over it with, uh, uh, with access to liquidity from the common lender of last resort the ECB but it's what uh, some people have called the tragedy of commons problems of the, of the Eurozone. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, now, this, has, uh, this, this, this problem of cross-border bank regulation has become more intensive over time. Uh, as you can see, these increasing foreign bank shares. Um, uh, or here, if you want to look at some uh, at the world map. Um, it has been also realized, of course, even within Europe before 2007. I mean, we, among economists, we had discussions about these issues before 2007. Our consensus was, um, I remember that from discussion, that well, unless there's a crisis, nothing will happen. Well, we've had the crisis. Um, now, one important thing is that, um, uh, of course, supervisors also realized there is something to be done about cross-border bank uh, uh, regulation, even before the crisis. Uh, but the tools they've been using turned out to not um, be very effective during the crisis. And for me, my favorite example is always uh, Fortis Bank, uh, which was a lender active in the Netherlands, Belgium, and uh, Luxembourg. Um, where you would have thought, given that the Benelux countries have been together for kind of somewhat linked with each other during the last 50, 60 years, uh, you could have thought that this cooperation should have worked very well. Well, it didn't. It broke down very, very quickly. Um, and basically, um, what I hear from insiders, there are two major issues. One, in spite of being so close to each other, there is a difference in the culture, in the supervisory culture between the National Bank of Belgium and the, uh, the Dutch Central Bank. And that somehow led to clashes even early on uh, before the crisis. But then really, in the end, uh, when it came to crisis resolution, um, as soon, even though initially they still did cooperate, as soon as the ministers of finance were asked to the table to put on taxpayer money, that's where things completely broke down. That's basically when the, the countries decided to go separate ways and each have their, their own uh, national uh, resolution of, the, of the each piece of, uh, of um, um, of, uh, of Fortis Bank. <clears throat> and the problem being, of course, in the culture of supervisors, at the end, everybody fights for him or herself. Memorandums of understanding are not legally binding unless you put it into the Banking Act, 
like for example Australia and New Zealand uh, did. And the value of this paper really is highly correlated with the equity price of a bank. As soon as a bank goes under, the, the memorandum of understanding is basically worthless. Um, so this, of course, would argue that um, you need stronger um, arrangements, and that you could argue, well, this, this gives us already the first um, kind of argument to having a, um, um, some kind of supranational supervisor. Not so fast. Um, um, you might not be able to actually construct something like that. The, the, a closer cooperation might not be possible. Mm -hmm. And we've heard a little bit already this morning, for example, different risk attitudes in the US and Europe, um, different uh, attitudes on how much in government intervention you want. And these different uh, the heterogeneity between countries might actually prevent um, countries from getting closer together and actually cooperate more, more closely. Um, of course, um, if you can think about this as a kind of two-dimensional um, uh, um, matrix um, where you have the externality, the degree of externalities coming from uh, cross-border banking and how heterogeneous countries are, um, then of course uh, the question is um, where are certain countries among this dimension and um, both, so what is the need for cross-border regulation according to the, 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 the degree of externalities coming from financial integration, the possibility to actually integrate, uh, which is the, um, the, uh, the vertical axis. Um, let me not go through all the examples, let me just mention two, two here actually. Um, for example, you can think about uh, the Nordic Baltic region um, as a region which is uh, very homogeneous, relatively speaking, at the same time very high externalities because they have very high integrated banking systems. And actually, um, as in kind of what the economists like to call reveal preferences, you can actually also see that the Nordic Baltic region has moved in terms of cross-border regulatory cooperation to a much closer link than before the crisis um, with a memorandum of understanding which actually goes beyond sunny day supervision to actually arrangements for bank resolution uh, if things go, uh, go really wrong. So you can see already steps in the, in the right direction among sub-regions, among countries that are, um, that, that are fa capable of actually doing it and where also the need arises such as in, the, um, in this region. Um, obviously, um, the one um, um, thing that I want to talk about now in the remaining five, ten minutes is the, uh, where the externalities are highest, which is a banking union, uh, because you have these additional externalities I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to come back to them in a moment, and where you should assume that if you have a currency union, and if you have an integrated banking system, actually then it should be also a relatively homogeneous area, politically speaking, which unfortunately we know it's not true, but um, uh, it, that's at least the way it should be. Um, now, coming to this uh, Eurozone crisis, um, uh, in addition to the, the, um, these uh, externalities that I mentioned earlier, um, coming from having a common land of last resort, um, we have, of course, this, uh, some people have already mentioned it, this deadly embrace of government and bank fragility, um, which in some cases started out on the bank side, such as in Spain, for example, um, where, where bank debt and uh, bank fragility led to sovereign fragility when the government had to step in. Uh, or Ireland, the other example, or the alternative way, uh, like in Greece, um, sovereign fragility then um, affecting the banking system, which relies on the, um, uh, which has holds a large share of uh, uh, Greek government uh, debt. Um, so this uh, this close interlinkage between national governments, national banks, um, has basi basically made them made both of them much weaker. Um, of course, behind that is. One reason behind that is, of course, the, the illusion that uh, government debt is uh, risk-free, uh, which is still being maintained in Europe, by the way. Um, so there's still um, uh, uh, zero percent uh, risk weight on government debt uh, in Europe, which, of course, makes it also more risk, more attractive for banks to actually hold this debt in the first place, um, which, of course, is, was behind this uh, supposed uh, great carry trade that the Cypriotic banks uh, they discovered in 2009, 2010, when they heavily started going into Greek government debt because it paid such nice high interest rates. Um, and it has zero uh, percent risk rate uh, until they found out in, in 2010, 2011 that it's actually not risk rate. Okay, so this is behind, of course, so this is one of the reasons behind the crisis, uh, kind of an additional element. Um, it, it, it doesn't apply necessarily to any currency union, so this is, uh, of course, this embraces uh, caused by several things, but it makes this, uh, the, the problem uh, in the Eurozone even, uh, even worse. Um, one way to describe this, actually, if you want to go down to the national level, um, as done by Daniel Gross from SEPS, uh, is to compare Nevada with Ireland. 
uh, two economies of very similar size and two economies with very similar experiences, uh, both having a housing boom and bus cycle. Um, of course, the difference being that um, Nevada is part of a uh, banking, fiscal, and political union. Ireland is not. Uh, and you've seen the repercussions um, of that, uh, where basically Ireland had to go um, uh, head to hand uh, uh, for bailouts, uh, whereas Nevada did not have to, uh, because um, Nevada, there are no Nevadan banks, or if there are Nevadan banks and they don't have Nevadan government bonds, um, and of course there are fiscal stabilizers throughout the US also positively affecting the shock in, uh, in Nevada. Um, now there were other ways to share the burden within the, 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 uh, within the Eurozone, uh, mostly through liquidity support measures, um, or some would argue through Target 2, um, including some that uh, were mentioned earlier this, uh, this morning. Um, and, um, um, but ultimately, um, uh, and maybe that's another dimension of the crisis, is that um, uh, this is all being basically based on national decisions, bank level and national decisions, where none of the players takes into account how, this, how their decisions affect the overall uh, Eurozone. Um, so these externalities that I mentioned earlier are not being internalized as they would be, for example, in the U.S., where you have a national government, a federal government, whereas in the Eurozone uh, you have um, by now 18 ministers of finance sitting together, each of them representing their individual country, but nobody in, uh, really representing the Eurozone um, uh, interests. So how could a banking union help here? Um, so first, um, the... Uh, um, addresses these macroeconomic imbalances that we have. Um, um, for example, uh, one observation since the crisis is that the, 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 the banking market has basically disintegrated uh, with banks kind of withdrawing to their national markets. And that affects, of course, the smaller countries and the crisis countries more. Um, and even a country like Ireland that has just come out of the, the Troika program is affected by this with foreign banks basically leaving Ireland and uh, reducing uh, competition. So it, it's not just a crisis effect, it's a general effect um, that there is a disintegration of the banking market and this has a negative effect. Um, um, of course, uh, you have the, the whole, um, and this is more again a general uh, um, uh, argument, the, the risk diversification effect. Um, and of course, you also have, um, uh, if you go to a banking union, uh, you cannot just uh, cut the link between uh, government and banks in terms of uh, these government bond holdings, but also supervisory links. Um, because you've seen it throughout the crisis that um, national supervisors got too close to the banks they were supposed to supervise. And um, as a German, I always have to say when I talk about Cajas in, uh, in Spain, um, which had a big governance problem and a regulatory problem, for every Caja in Spain, there's at least one Landesbank in Germany that also had a problem of governance and of regulation. So it's not just a problem for crisis countries. It's definitely also a problem for some of the so-called uh, uh, core problems. Um, Okay, so, and of course, the, the, the ultimate uh, outcome that we would like to have with the banking union is that to go back to an <coughs> integrated banking system, to a sing back to a single market in banking, but in a sustainable manner, not in a way as we had it in the uh, pre-crisis, uh, where interest rate, nominal interest rate converged, but uh, risk-adjusted interest rate did not converge, um, because risk was not taken into account anymore. Um, and ultimately, um, by having a, a going back to a single banking market, also um, have to see, see the banking system as part of the growth compact and try to restart growth and uh, uh, get beyond this 0.3 or 0.5 uh, uh, growth rates that some people see as uh, 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 might be our recovery. Um, the question, of course, is um, uh, the banking union for whom? Um, and leading up, uh, over the past years, there have been a lot of discussion which countries should be included and which institutions should be included. Um, and of course, uh, the, if, if, if you remember back about the, these, uh, these externality that I mentioned that we have within the currency union, which is this uh, common land of last resort, for example, uh, the government uh, bank embrace, um, it, is of, uh, it is not just an issue of large cross-border banks, of the 130 banks that are now supposedly being supervised by the ECB starting later this year, but it's about all banks. And we know that problems don't always start from the big banks. Uh, the Cajas are relatively small institutions. Some of the Landesbanken in Germany were not big institutions, and some of the other lenders in Germany affected by the crisis were also not big institutions. So none of them would actually fall under the, um, uh, uh, the ECB supervision. So it's not an issue of small versus large, it's an issue about the banking systems as such. 
these externalities within the, the currency union really come from banking system as such, not from individual institutions, just from individual large institutions. Um, now, if you talk about countries, um, it seems for me more an issue of really the Eurozone itself, uh, where the need to join such a banking union seems to be much less uh, uh, clear for non-Eurozone countries that are part of the European Union, um, such as Sweden, for example, or such as uh, uh, Poland, uh, because, of, of course, there's a whole set of other challenges that uh, we might come back later on uh, to discuss, um, but certainly there are kind of alternative uh, options uh, um, uh, for such countries to co-opt with uh, such a, a Eurozone banking union, but the, the case itself seems to be more clear for, for, the, for the Eurozone. Now, one important thing is um, uh, that commentators have pointed out is that uh, we're doing it step by step. In every step that we're doing, as long as it's in the right direction, is a good step. And I would strongly disagree with that. Um, go, doing just the supervision part of the banking union, the single supervisory mechanism, in my, case, in my uh, uh, opinion, is not a step in the right direction. It might actually be uh, counterproductive. Um, it's basically, if you have a crime-infested city, you send more police out on the street, but you don't give them any weapon or any actually legal base to actually intervene. And a similar situation is right now, the ECB is supposed to take over supervision of these 130 um, institutions. However, the intervention decision and the resolution itself is still on the national level, even um, uh, what is planned now for the, the resolution part, um, uh, even if it eventually might turn into a European solution. Um, but uh, obviously, um, uh, can the supervisor itself call on a weak bank if it knows that there will be no way to actually resolve, to intervene and resolve this, uh, this weak bank, especially if it's located in a country uh, where basically the, the, the own government uh, either doesn't have the, the legal framework or doesn't have the resources to actually resolve the weak bank. So it might actually be counterproductive and might actually turn the, the ECB into a, a more lenient supervisor because they are afraid if they cry wolf, then uh, they will just uh, cause panic rather than help um, the bank uh, being intervened and being resolved. So it might actually have a certain counterproductive element to it uh, by having just supervision and not having uh, um, uh, the whole, I guess you can call it three pack, uh, which is, uh, would be supervision, resolution, and funding for resolution, which could be deposit insurance or some other resolution fund. Um, now, okay, the, the title went a little bit too high. Um, the other important point I want to make is, uh, in, the, in this whole discussion currently, uh, there are two things that are being confused. Uh, one is the banking union for the future, or as somebody said this morning, for the next crisis, which I think even for the next crisis, it's not worthwhile as, as it stands right now. The other part is the current crisis. And obviously, the banking union as it's being constructed right now does not solve the current crisis because even the resolution fund that's being built up is supposed to be ready in, I don't know, in five years or six years or in ten years. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But definitely, there will, there will not be enough um, uh, for the current crisis that is still ongoing in many countries, um, in Spain, in Italy, um, partly maybe even in Germany. Uh, it's, it, it cannot be addressed by the current uh, um, uh, by the current structure as we uh, as, it's, it's, as it's being envisioned. Um, uh, that's why I, with some other courses, came up with the idea of why not why not separate these two, which actually also in a political circum uh, political viewpoint makes much more sense. Resolve the current crisis immediately, not immediately but rapidly, which has been delayed already anyway far too long. <coughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons why the U.S. has come out of the crisis much more quickly than, uh, than the Eurozone, because the crisis was addressed much more rapidly. Um, on the one hand, resolve the crisis. On the, one, on the other hand, gain the time and space to actually build up a, um, a relevant and an effective banking union for the long term and for the next, uh, for the next crisis. So that's why, um, and of course, Sweden is a good example. Actually, the Nordic countries in general are a good example that if you, re the faster you resolve a banking crisis, uh, the faster you get out of the mess that you got into. Um, and I think that's one lesson that definitely has not been learned in the in the current eurozone crisis, at least not yet. I mean, that's why we, we came up with a suggestion to actually have a, a kind of a um, eurozone level AMC or asset management company. I forgot exactly how it was called here in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, you can call it like a European recapitalization agency, uh, which would basically would take over banks that are being considered non-viable, uh, either non-viable or only partly viable, by the stress test, 
by the asset quality review that's being undertaken by the ECB right now, this uh, agency will take over these banks, either liquidate them if they're non-viable, or turn them around with additional equity investment, uh, with additional funds, and eventually sell them off, maybe even at a small gain. Um, politically, also much more sensible, I would argue, uh, because um, uh, you don't give German taxpayers this impression that if, you, if they get into a banking union, they have to pay for the rest of the Eurozone for the rest of for the next couple of generations, but rather recognize losses now, allocate them, and then move on. Um, let them pay now, and actually give them even an upside uh, stake in these uh, weak banks uh, through equity investment uh, through these uh, recapitalization agencies. Um, yes, yeah, so we have some uh, ideas on how, how we actually could do this. Uh, actually. Um, uh, housed at the ESM, for example, um, um, but of course it, it still needs a fiscal backstop, so the ESM money would probably not be enough. Um, so let me then just conclude, because I think I've already went over time. Um, uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, resolution is, has kind of been the little bit ignored uh, part of the regulatory uh, reform agenda, although there has been progress made, but the one um, uh, level where it has been really missing is the, um, is the Eurozone level. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the single supervisor mechanism by itself will not help unless it is matched with a effective resolution and funding mechanism to actually intervene banks and uh, resolve them. And definitely the banking union, even if constructed in a perfect way, as the economists like to talk about, will not help for the resolution of the cri current crisis, should not help for the resolution of the current crisis. Rather, we need a more immediate crisis resolution mechanisms to address the crisis now, whose resolution has been delayed already too long for, for too many years. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we'll have another speaker here as well. Um, sorry, the name's right, right here, so it should be like that. So, um, next speaker is uh, Nicolas Veron. And uh, Nicola uh, is a senior fellow at the uh, Bruggen in uh, think tank in Brussels, and also a visiting fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington DC. And uh, Nicola is also, has also been pointed out as one of the, should say, one of the brains behind the banking union idea, or at least one of the one of the persons who have really driven the discussion forward. So uh, I'm very happy to have you here, Nicola. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have to start uh, with an apology because I missed the morning session and this was uh, basically uh, not something I could avoid because I was flying in from the US. I'm already happy to have made it in time, which uh, was not a given. Um, so thanks again. It's, it's, uh, I was really keen to come here because uh, my experience and uh, Pear has uh, uh, been generous enough to invite me in other uh, contexts here in Stockholm. My experience is that in this country there is a, a very vibrant, I mean, in a way, geographically Sweden is at the periphery of Europe, but there is a much more vibrant than I would say more debate about these policy issues than I see in many countries, including some larger ones. So it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I work, as you mentioned, at two uh, different uh, think tanks, Bruegel in Brussels, the Peterson Institute in Washington. Both are very dependent. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, of course, I'm just giving my opinions here, not the opinions of my employers in those think tanks. Uh, and if you want to know more about how we defend this independence, uh, both on the Bruegel website and on the Peterson Institute website, there are some clarifications. I say that because, especially in a forum like this one, you know, it's easy to uh, um, uh, hear people who may uh, not be fully free of uh, their agenda in terms of the way they look at the policy agenda. Uh, we, we cherish this independence a lot. Okay, so um, I don't have a PowerPoint slides because I wanted to complement what Torsten would have to say, and I really will uh, continue where uh, Torsten has left it in a way. Uh, so I will expand on his presentation and, uh, and uh, give my own views. In general, there is a lot of convergence between the way I look at uh, these issues and the way he, uh, and, and the, the presentation he gave. So I think we converge a lot on the analytical framework, but to make the discussion more lively, we also have differences on the policy assessment. And, uh, and that's good. Uh, I'm generally more positive, I guess, uh, if I take Torsten's two conclusions, uh, a single supervisory mechanism may be unhelpful, worse than doing nothing, and the crisis resolution is indefinitely postponed. I would say I've become a bit more optimistic, even so I've 
shared a lot of the critique in the past. I've become a bit more optimistic recently, and basically since mid-2012 when banking union uh, went from uh, a theoretical perspective to a concrete project, um, and, uh, and I'll explain why. So I work, I, I'll sp be speak about, a bit about the sort of general you know, uh, view of Banking Union, uh, a focus on the asset quality review process, which uh, Torsten, I think, mentioned but didn't focus much on. Uh, some comments on the uh, late December uh, discussion on single resolution mechanism, uh, which dominates the current headlines on Banking Union, even though I will argue that it's not that important. Um, some forward-looking comments on uh, how Banking Union might transform the European financial system on a more structural level. Uh, and also how it affects non-Eurozone countries, uh, starting with Sweden. Uh, and a conclusion on the very purpose of your workshop, which is have we learned from those financial crises? Can we make the financial system more stable? Uh, and, uh, and some tentative uh, views on this. So let me try to be very concise on all these points so that we have enough time for interaction uh, afterwards. On the... <coughs> On the sort of general assessment, I mean, uh, I think Torsten's point is to say there are two, like is usually the case in banking crisis, right? You, have, you need to put out the fire and you need to build a, a, a more sustainable architecture. And this was the case in Sweden in the early 90s. You did crisis management and you did a new legislation and a new policy framework. If you take the US, it's exactly the same. They did a crisis management from October 2008 to uh, May 2009 when the results of the stress test were announced. And then they did the Dodd-Frank Act, which started just afterwards in June 2009 and was voted in uh, June 2010. And then we have an endless sequence of implementation. Uh, so that would be the logical sequence. You do crisis management, you resolve the crisis, then you build a stable architecture. Um, I've made that critique too, actually, uh, together with Adam Posen, who is now the president of the Peterson Institute. We had a paper in mid-2009, so even before there was a sovereign crisis which uh, made exactly that case. You know, there's a big banking problem in Europe. Banks are fragile. It has to be resolved. Look at what Sweden did. It was not perfect, but it was about the best practices around. And uh, create a, 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 an instrument for restructuring and resolution. Uh, so a, a temporary instrument, basically, a temporary agency. And then you will be able, once you have done that, to build a single supervisory framework uh, and have the long-term architecture in place. So that was mid-2009, and I think Torsten's uh, uh, narrative really is sort of the same, saying crisis resolution first, uh, long-term build-up uh, next. So I agree with this in theory. Why did things happen differently? Uh, and why do we have this bizarre sequence where we have front-loaded the transformation of the architecture and uh, delayed crisis management? Well, obviously, it's politics, and uh, more specifically, I think it's a question of trust. Basically, Mrs. Merkel's reasoning, if I can read her mind, which, of course, nobody can, uh, I cannot either, but I try, uh, is that there had to be, a, basically, there was a deficit of trust among member states. Germans don't trust uh, other member states, don't trust the European Commission, don't trust European institutions, and even at the time, with the European Central Bank, there is this you know, sort of tug of war between the Bundesbank and the European Central Bank, so it's not. And so my understanding of, if I want to be constructive in interpreting what has been decided, and I think there is a case to be constructive, because I, I disagree with the notion that you know, there has been only national egoism. There have been efforts to address the crisis, even so these efforts have been insufficient. I think the idea was to say, let's build a common basis of trust. Let's have an institution we can have confidence in, and that will be the ECB, and it will look at all those banks, and it will form a picture of what really happens. So that the government of country X cannot just shuffle losses to our taxpayers uh, under the cover of European integration. And if you look at it this way, it made sense. It made sense to say, let's first have a capability to form a picture of what's actually happening in the financial system and trust it in a credible, authoritative institution. And frankly, there was not really uh, alternatives to the ECB in this respect, because we tried the new institution with the European Banking Authority. And let's face it, it has been a failure. Uh, so it has to be an established institution. 
And this institution will create a common platform of trust. And once we have it, then we can uh, envisage uh, next steps. Now, there was a twist to this, and the twist is the asset quality review. Because I don't think when Mrs. Merkel uh, and the German authorities more generally defined this agenda, which was to say supervision first, and then we can envisage the next step and resolution, and maybe one day deposit insurance, even though we don't want to talk about it now. Uh, so this very step-by-step -step agenda, which Torsten rightly said doesn't make sense from a purely sort of abstract policy perspective, um, I don't think they understood how important the AQR would be. Uh, asset quality review, as you know, is this process in which the uh, ECB will look at all the big banks in the European, uh, in the Eurozone or banking union financial system, will look at their balance sheets, will stress test them, will do a risk assessment. So I call it asset quality review. It's actually a more comprehensive assessment, but AQR is now the acronym that everybody uses. So after having tried to fight it, I uh, joined it. Um, and, uh, and, and the thing is that this process of AQR, which will happen uh, is this year and is, uh, is uh, expected to be completed in November, is actually front-loading all the transparency piece of it. And what that means is that will, it will also front-load and accelerate the restructuring because once you say, well, this bank actually is severely undercapitalized or even insolvent, then you cannot say, I will deal with this situation in three years' time when we have a single resolution mechanism that is operational. You have to address it now, because otherwise you have a run. And therefore, I, I frankly think policymakers didn't realize that they would have this very important transformative element of schedule, that the AQR was necessary for the uh, creation of the SSM, because you cannot tell the ECB, well, you take all, over all those banks, and then you're responsible for supervisory failures in the past. So there had to be a sort of resetting of the counters. But uh, it's much more impactful than they realized. The AQR is in the, the last article or near last article of the uh, regulation that establishes the single supervisory mechanism. It was there from the start. It was in the initial dr commission draft of September 2012. Nobody cared about it. It was not discussed. It was not a big point of negotiation. Now it's what everybody's talking about in the financial community uh, because it's what really uh, is impactful. So basically, I disagree on the uh, proposition that the SSM without SRM or with a very flawed SRM as we're likely to get is worse than the status quo. I think we have the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, which does uh, give a, a high degree, even so it's not complete, of harmonization of national frameworks. So we can uh, address what Torsten said, well, it's bad if each uh, national resolution framework is different from a legal point of view. Now, we have this harmonization. It's not yet adopted, but it will be in the next few weeks. We have a lot of market stabilization, not least due to banking union announcements, uh, which means that sovereign spreads are low now. And that means that in the baseline scenario, of course, nothing is for certain, but in the baseline scenario, uh, the linkage between banks and sovereigns uh, will not be a major impediment to banks restructuring, at least in countries like France and Italy, let alone Germany, uh, in uh, the, this year. Of uh, course, assuming nothing goes massively wrong uh, later on in the year, but I guess that is the baseline scenario. And um, also the point that Torsten uh, emphasized, which is that there is this sort of uh, illogical and indefensible exemption of small banks in the single supervisory mechanism. Actually, it's not really an exemption, because if the ECB wants to supervise these banks directly, it can. It's just delayed and a sort of political compromise because of the enormous political power of the savings banks in Germany and the community banks in Germany. So uh, it was a sub to a very powerful constituency. But basically, they have won that battle. They have lost the war, and they know it. Because the ECB can start supervising savings banks in Germany whenever it wants. And the same for all small banks uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Eurozone. So actually, it suits the ECB, because it's already a massive logistical challenge to uh, assess all this 130 or so banks around the Eurozone. So uh, they wouldn't be able to do the same for the 8,000 or 7,000 or whatever the number is right now of banks in the Eurozone. So, uh, so, so it's just delayed. Uh, it's inaccurate to paint the small bank exemption as uh, permanent. <coughs> now, let me focus briefly on the asset quality review. So it's a pros in the spe special jargon, it's a process that uh, is often described as triage, recapitalization, restructuring. What is triage? In, in, originally, it's a military term. Uh, in the First World War, I think, uh, or one of the colonial wars before. So basically, when you're uh, um, a doctor on a battlefield after the battle, 
you have to uh, do a very quick sorting out of uh, the bodies you find. Some are broadly fine, some are beyond repair, and some can be saved. And this is brutal uh, and, frankly, a bit traumatizing process where you have to decide especially who is beyond repair and who, is, who can be saved. Um, so that is triage. And I think it's the same for banks. It's basically to say, well, which bank can recapitalize themselves and basically be considered a going concern in the jargon of the financial community, and which banks basically are insolvent for all practical purposes. As you probably know, insolvency is an opinion, not a fact. Uh, but uh, but uh, in this case, uh, it really has to be uh, strongly um, established. Uh, the ECB will do the triage. Uh, the banks that are solvent will recapitalize. Some of them are already starting to do so. They are anticipating on the deadline of late 2014. And some of the banks will not be able to recapitalize because actually they're insolvent under any uh, logical definition, and therefore they will have to be restructured. The ECB is not going to do the restructuring. The member states will do the restructuring because that's been the political compromise. This round of restructuring is to deal with the legacy. As Thorsten said, the Germans are not going to pay for others, and therefore there is no solidarity uh, financial mechanism uh, at the European level. So it's a national backstop to use the current jargon. That's fine. Uh, again, with the current market conditions, I think most countries, uh, possible exception is Portugal, but most countries, including uh, Spain and Italy, are probably going to be able to uh, meet whatever financial liability emerges uh, or is crystallized for them in this uh, exercise without massive market disruption. If, there are, if one of those countries is incapable of doing it, then Portugal comes to mind. Uh, but not, uh, I mean, it depends on your scenario on what will happen this year in terms of you know, the oil market, China, uh, Russia, Iran, whatever you want. So we don't know what the situation will be in November. But let's have a baseline scenario. Uh, the ESM is here. The ESM can lend to uh, governments which have lost market access. So therefore, there is an infrastructure. It's not the case that there is no backstop. Um, the ECB is starting this exercise very purposefully. I think they're having a much better start than I would have expected them to, because supervision is a new task for them, so I expected them to make many mistakes before they would learn their turf. I think they're learning faster than I expected them to. This is encouraging. They did a, a comprehensive communication about the AQR in late October. I think it was masterfully done, frankly. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, of course, they will make mistakes, and uh, there will be difficult moments, and that's inevitable in uh, this learning process, but so far, I would say, so encouraging. The key will be the uh, restructuring piece, as I said, and here, frankly, we don't have a framework. There is no policy framework on bail-in, on how a restructuring will be executed by national uh, member states uh, generally, and I agree with Torsten on this. We need some central instrument of financial engineering. He calls it a European recapitalization agency. In my paper in 2009 with Adam Posen, I called it a European banking toy hunt to provoke the Germans. Uh, and, uh, and other people would call it simply a European bad bank. Uh, for example, there was a very interesting recent proposal by a partner at Deloitte about creating such a European bad bank that would have synergies at the European level but would not entail uh, risk mutualization among member states, which I think does, is the case with, uh, with uh, Torsten's proposal. So I think there are, you know, there are many options for financial engineering. Of course, the reference that everybody has in mind is the Bank Support Authority in Sweden in 92, 93, and I think this is generally considered as having been uh, successful. Uh, but, um, but I think this will come. The reason why uh, Torsten has not been uh, invited to design the European uh, uh, recapitalization agency by the ECOFIN Council yet is that at this point politically it's a non-starter. Uh, nobody wants to do it. Think just of Greece. Gre at some point the Troika wanted Greece to, because Greece was not successful with its privatization pro program and Greece obviously is much more of a ward of the Troika than any other country at this point and the Troika said well why don't we create a European agency that would do your privatization, no risk mutualization, just in order to execute it better, right? And the political consensus in Greece was no way. So imagine this uh, for countries which are not under program and uh, in, are much bigger than Greece and uh, think uh, more proudly about their sovereignty. Uh, it's, at this point, it's a political non-starter. But uh, we don't know how things will evolve this year. And at some point, maybe it will be, maybe it's just maybe it will be the case that the European policymakers will recognize that this is the right thing to do if they want to maximize the gains, minimize the loss for their taxpayers, for themselves, and for their uh, respective economies.
in this process of restructuring. So I'm reasonably hopeful that we'll have a lively debate on this question of financial in engineering of the restructuring that will follow the AQR in 2014 and that progress can be made. So watch this space. SRM deal very quickly, so you've read uh, certainly about it. 18 December, the ECOFIN came up with a very Byzantine pro proposal uh, to do a single resolution mechanism with a single resolution board, which will be a European Union agency based in Brussels, reporting uh, to both the European Commission and the Council, and a single resolution fund that will be created by uh, a, a separate treaty, basically, like the I, uh, ESM, so with an intergovernmental uh, agreement uh, to be negotiated in the next two or three months. Um, this is not a final uh, status, uh, the international agreement is not yet negotiated, even so they have been agreed on terms of reference, but these are actually quite vague. Uh, and the European Parliament has, uh, uh, its, um, has to assent, uh, because it's a co-decision on the establishment of the Single Resolution Board, and the European Parliament has made it very clear that they were not happy with the proposal. So these two issues are linked, because one of the things that makes the European Parliament unhappy is precisely the fact that the single resolution fund was removed from the community framework and shifted to an intergovernmental special treaty. We'll see how it goes. I think it's too early to judge, frankly. I see some good aspects in the proposal, but many bad aspects, and essentially the complexity and the fact that uh, the process is going to be very murky. If you apply the process of uh, resolution to a case like Fortis, for example, which is a very good example of a, a cross-border bank in Europe, uh, in a, in a real-world resolution uh, situation, as Thorsten said, um, it's uh, likely to be at almost as dysfunctional as what we experienced in 2008, which frankly is not a recommendation. So, um, so, so SRM at this point is not uh, very encouraging, but really I think it's secondary to the AQR. I think the big issue right now is precisely this fact that the so situation of the banking sector is being tackled as a precondition for the establishment of the SSM that Mrs. Merkel has said will be the next step. And, uh, and, and, and I think this is, again, I don't think anybody really had thought through all the consequences, but I think this is the real story of, two, of 2014. This is the real test for the banking union. And at this point, as I said, I'm reasonably uh, encouraged by uh, the first signals. Uh, still remains to be seen how it develops. Now, a word about uh, how banking union will transform the structures of the European financial system. And I want to be very brief here. Um, to me, the story of the crisis has been a story of banking crisis as much as sovereign crisis. I think this was controversial two years ago. It's no longer controversial now. Uh, the very acceptance by the European policy community of this idea of the, the vicious circles, the doom loop, whatever you call it, the deadly embrace between sovereign and banks. Uh, this is a recognition, very late in the day, but the belated recognition that this crisis was not just about sovereign uh, crisis, was about banking crisis, first and foremost. So that's good. My view is that the driver really has been banking nationalism. It has been national member states, and I think Torsten agrees with this. Uh, it has been member, member states trying to promote and defend their national banking champions, and, uh, and this has existed in all member states more in some than others. This is what Torsten called the uh, supervisory links uh, uh, in his presentation. And if you think that, uh, make a long story short, if you, if you uh, shift supervision from the national level to the ECB, frankly, banking nationalism loses its most powerful weapon. So I think this is very structural, because basically the ECB will have no incentive to be nationalistic, at least intra-Europe or intra-banking union. Of course, then there is a question of the global implications of this, and I'll come to it briefly. But, uh, but it will remove basically what has been the poison of the European financial system in the last two decades, and what has created this enormous instability in our system, enormous leverage of banks, uh, uh, excessive risk taking, because every bank wanted to be a winner in the coming round of uh, competition and consolidation in the single market. So I think it was really the mismatch between national banking frameworks and the single market that has been very damaging in terms of financial stability. And the SSM um, addresses that. Um, I think. The ECB will have a better capacity than many uh, national supervisors just because it's bigger, it has critical mass, it has resources, it has authority, it will build competence. It is actually building competence at a surprisingly rapid pace because it started from nothing 
in late 2012 and now they're uh, starting to have some real capabilities. So I think this idea that by <coughs> pooling the supervisory resources, you have a better supervision is not completely devoid of content. Of course, the risk is that you create a big bureaucracy and it will lose contact with what's happening on the ground. And I think this risk is real, but in a way it's checked by the structure of the single supervisory mechanism because we still have national supervisors. Uh, but I think that's real. I think there will be much more discipline because when you remove the banking nationalism, you remove the incentives for member states to exert forbearance. Think, of, for example, of the negotiation about the Basel III international accord. It's well known that both France and Germany were trying to water it down and are still trying to water it down uh, to defend their bank's special interests. I think it's a safe bet that the ECB will not do that, or at least not nearly to the same extent. So basically, you will have more discipline, less forbearance and probably a better adherence to international uh, regulatory framework. So ECB will encourage, not discourage, cross-border integration, cross-border m and the banking sector. Uh, so this, uh, this will have massive structural impact on the, on, the, on the banking market. It will also probably encourage non-bank funding, uh, so what banks try to demonize as shadow banking, but which is actually very useful, the fact that you have a diversified financial system where you, when you have alternative uh, financing channels and not everything relies on banks, as is the case right now in many Eurozone countries, uh, because the ECB has no reason, uh, a bit like in the US, I mean, the, the ECB has no reason to repress competitive threats to the established banks in the ways that many national authorities do. So, so I, I'm also... All this is about the long term. I'm not saying this will happen in one year, but I'm reasonably optimistic about this uh, long term outlook. And last but not least, the ECB will be much more influential on the global stage uh, than any of the national authorities is. I mean, Germany is a big country in Europe, but how influential are the Bundesbank or BaFin in international regulatory conversations or international policy making? Very little. The ECB will be a much bigger influence on the par with the Fed, or at least in the same league. And I think that's also very good for us. So the big question mark is uh, on all this is uh, I've sort of fudged the geography here. I've talked about Europe, but what is Europe, right? Is it the Eurozone? Is it the Eurozone plus a couple of countries that would join the banking union? Is it the European Union, including Sweden and the UK? Well, I'll give you my take here, and uh, this is uh, from somebody who doesn't live in Sweden and therefore uh, doesn't know a lot about this country, so uh, you, you, you are a better place to judge. My impression is that Sweden and the UK are really very different cases. Uh, at this point, Minister Bohr, uh, of which I'm a fan, um, he's a rock star in the international policy circuit, as you know, uh, not only because of his haircut, mm -hmm. um, he often comes to the Peterson Institute, and he's always presented like that, you know. Minister Borg, you're a rock star, uh, and everybody else knows. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, I think Sweden has taken a very negative view on banking union, and uh, has said, well, we are not going to participate no matter what. Maybe that justified, you know, sort of out of caution, and see how it develops. Uh, Denmark, strikingly, is much more engaged. Um, I think Denmark will join the banking union, even if it uh, doesn't join the Eurozone. Uh, I don't know when exactly. And I think ultimately there's a very strong case for Sweden to join as well, because of the interconnections between the Sweden fi Swedish financial system. And also because of the structures of the Swedish financial authorities, you have the FSA, which is separate from the Riksbanks, and I think it makes the integration of a country with a separate currency, but uh, a supervisory uh, structure which is separate from the central bank, it makes it easier, all things equal, than if you had supervision inside the central bank. So I'm, uh, if I look at the medium term, I think there's a very strong case for Sweden to join. The UK, of course, is different. And it's much more in uncertain. And, and as you know, at this point, the question is whether the UK will stay in the EU at all or not. And this is a question which is raised not only by people in the EU, or not principally by people in the EU who think the UK is unconstructive, but by Brits themselves. Um, and, um, and I think it will be a mistake for the UK um, if I try to put myself in, a, in an Englishman or Brit uh, shoes. Um, I think it will be a mistake to, uh, to, to uh, exit the European Union. I think it's actually a mistake for the UK not to participate in the banking union. But of course, I'm not English. I'm not British. So who am I to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to judge? And, uh, and ultimately, they will make the decision. I think there's not enough debate in Brussels about this, not enough informed debate in the UK. So I think we're sort of sleepwalking uh, 
charge of separation which will be harmful not only for the UK but also for the rest of Europe. I'm very concerned about this. I think I see by orders of magnitude not enough attention to this question in Brussels compared to what I think should be the case. I think it's a major risk for Europe. But here we are. Conclusion, sorry for having been longer than I wanted to, but still within my allocated time. Uh, will all this make the system more stable? Well, I think I've tried to um, make the case that the banking union would be good for European financial stability. Anyway, crises don't repeat themselves. The next crisis will be different. There will be a next crisis because that's part of the system. I think there are lessons learned, and, uh, and here I will, uh, I will probably uh, be, again, quite aligned with what uh, Thorsten had to say. Uh, resolution is a new world, new word in Europe. Until uh, this crisis, almost all European countries basically had no framework for closing a bank outside of normal insolvency. It didn't have a resolution framework if you define resolution as an administrative or hybrid administrative judicial uh, uh, process that is an orderly alternative to uh, a court-instructed insolvency, which is generally disorderly in the banking system because of uh, the possibility of bank runs. So we have 70 years after the US, 70, seven decades late, but better late than never, we are moving to a uh, framework we ha where we have this resolution framework, and I think that's very good. Um, and we have bail-in in it, which is normal because it comes with the territory. Uh, bail-in and resolution are basically two faces of the same coin. I think Sweden moved in that direction in the 90s after the lessons of the crisis. When it solved this, its crisis, it couldn't do bail-in uh, because it didn't have a framework. It created the framework later, and I think that's... Uh, Encouraging, basically, that's what Europe does. I'm skeptical on the possibility to do bail-in on a massive scale in resolving this crisis, but I think it's very good that Europe is now committed uh, to having it uh, as part of its permanent uh, policy framework. The other thing is something I alluded uh, to just before, and the question of banks versus non-banks in the financial system, or uh, the question of diversity of the financial system, or if you want to use that jargon, shadow banking. I think the lesson of this crisis is really that having a diverse financial system is really good for financial stability. Because look at it this way. The crisis originated in the US because so many banks in Europe had uh, bought the US toxic waste. The financial shock was sort of symmetrical in 2008 between the US and Europe. The US resolved this crisis in less than a year. Europe is still in it. So of course, this is oversimplifying. But I think the reason why the US, there are many reasons why the US was able to address uh, this shock much quicker than the European Union. And I'm not saying the structure of the financial system is the only one of it, but I think it played a role. It's because basically the US could afford to be harsh with its banks because there were other parts of the financial system which could take the bait on and continue to provide credit to the economy while, while the banking system was deleveraging and restructuring. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have not been able to resolve the crisis in Europe and now are doing it with enormous pain uh, because we were too dependent on the bank. So I think one of the lessons is it's good to have a fi diversified financial system, if you want to call it that way. And at the risk of being provocative, I would say it's good to have shadow banking, not to have only banking. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, also one of the lessons. I'll stop, here, I'll stop here. And again, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. So, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion now on this, so you can actually stay here up on stage. And uh, I'd like uh, Per Vizien to join us. Uh, Torsten again, of course. Um, per Vizien, who is uh, a junk professor at the Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, also, uh, I should take Hey, you're something more, aren't you? Managing Director at the Institute for Financial Research. Um, and also, I'd like to have Philip here again. Have you found your respective signs? Yes. This is yours. Uh, so, good to have you all here. <coughs> so, uh, I found this very interesting. I, I brought Philip here up again. Uh, maybe almost to Philippe's own surprise, because I thought you had a very good chapter on this in your, in your book, Aftershock. So I hope we'll get into some of that, the things you wrote there. <clears throat> uh, 
Well, so we've heard about now about the banking union. Should we, could we put it down to just a short? Will there really be a, a banking union with all the steps that that uh, that should be in a banking union? Philip is already shaking his head. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think there is a banking union. Uh, it's a sham. It exists on paper, uh, but it will not exist uh, in practice. Um, I mean, I take issue with almost every um, point that has been made. Um, first of all, uh, the notion that somehow, I mean, the idea of, of, of having a banking union is somehow that the ECB is going to be more detached from the banking sector than national supervisors have been. I don't think there's any evidence of that being true whatsoever. Throughout this crisis, it has not behaved in that way. As recently as last summer, Mario Draghi wrote to the European Commission asking for the new state aid rules which limit um, bailouts uh, to banks, uh, asked for them uh, not to be uh, applied as a result of this balance sheet assessment that it's doing. So I don't think that element is true. Second of all, I don't think that the ECB has the requisite information and powers to act as a proper supervisor. Uh, Torsten pointed out it's only the largest banks. Uh, it doesn't cover the, the smallest banks. More importantly, you know, if national supervisors and banks lie to the ECB, how does it know whether, 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 if it's being lied to? Uh, and uh, how, therefore, is it going to be able to obtain uh, the information that it needs? I mean, you can get a step behind that and actually question whether bank supervision really is a panacea. I'm you know, more Hayekian, Hayekian about that. I think, simply, simply don't think that supervisors um, have uh, in any state of the world the information uh, to be able to do that uh, and that bank, the banks are always going to be much better informed than supervisors are. But second of all, in terms of, in terms of the resolution, I mean, if, as, as, the, as the resolution mechanism exists now, basically um, there is ample discretion for national supervisors, national governments, um, uh, both to block resolution uh, and to dictate the terms of any, any resolution that does happen. And if you think that basically the political economy of the crisis hasn't changed, which is basically governments want to save every bank they can, it's just that some governments have run out of money, those in southern Europe, whereas those in northern Europe haven't, then in effect what's going to happen is, is that you will have one system in, in southern Europe, which is when a bank runs out of money, if the government doesn't have um, the cash to, 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 to bail it out, that the creditors will be bailed in, which is what happened in Cyprus. And you have one system in Northern Europe, which is, you know, uh, in the event that a bank runs into difficulty, um, uh, that the government will be in a position um, uh, to bail it out. And in fact, because of the knowledge of that, it probably won't run into problems in, in the first place because um, markets will trust that the government will always be there to bail it out. So in effect, then you don't have a banking union, you have, you have a completely tilted playing field. You have Southern Europe, um, where, where um, uh, banks are no longer subsidised and as a result have a higher cost of capital. And you have Northern Europe where banks, rem where banks remain subsidised by the government, have an artificially low cost of capital as a result. Now, you could resolve that by allowing Northern banks to take over Southern banks. Now, and that would solve it at one level, but the presumption behind that is somehow that these Northern banks are better managed. Uh, and therefore that this would make the system more efficient. And that's not true. I mean, for the most part, they're not better managed. Uh, they're just backed by their government. So I don't think we have a banking union at all. Uh, and I don't think we're going to have one uh, anytime soon. Okay, that was. <laughs> I'm very glad I brought you this panel. Actually, flip. Um, Nicola. Just very yes. briefly, I agree with the last sentence of, uh, uh, that, that, that was made by, um, by Philippe, uh, even so I don't agree with uh, many of his other points. Banking union is a long-term project. If you define banking union, as I think one should, as the shift of the instruments of banking policy from the national to the European level, it's not going to be finished anytime soon. If you de define it by the policy objective that was set out by the leaders, which is to break the feedback loop between banks and sovereigns, it will not be completed as long as we don't have a federal deposit insurance and we won't have that anytime soon. So in a strict sense, uh, Philip is right, uh, we, won't have a we don't have a banking union, we won't have one anytime soon. The question is whether the progress we're making in the direction of banking union is constructive, helpful or not. And here we have differences. I don't think it's a sham. I think the ECB will have much better access to uh, bank uh, information bypassing the national authorities if they don't cooperate, and Philip described it. Uh, I agree on the risk of having a two-speed system uh, where there is bail-in in the south, bail-out in the north, and I think this is a big concern, but I'm hopeful 
that it will be addressed over time. Think a bit of the difference between Denmark and Sweden in 2011, for example, when Denmark uh, was uh, rigorous in terms of bail-in uh, in these two small uh, side banks. I think, you know, these... Um, it will not be uh, harmonized in one step, probably, but I think there are some self-correcting uh, dynamics here. Uh, <coughs> so it is uh, probably the biggest challenge this year. So, uh, so, so I'm more optimistic. Hi, please. Um, I think this, the crisis on Cyprus illustrates the need for rules and sort of peop know, people knowing how to handle a bank in distress. Uh, and a working banking union can supply that. Uh, the situation in Cyprus was that it was clear that one or maybe two banks could not continue live on and people were nervous that the crisis in Cyprus would spread to other European countries, called contagion. Uh, and then the question was who was going to pay for saving these uh, banks in Cyprus? And there were nightly negotiations in Brussels between politicians and should the depositors or the holders of bonds or whatever, when you take somebody's money to use it to save the bank, then it's called a bail-in. We've used the term bail-in. It's not sort of common language, really. Uh, and people didn't know. The investors did not know. The bondholders, whether their money would be converted into equity or used to save the banks or somebody else's, or rich Russians or ordinary households or whatever. And that creates nervousness and chaos in such a situation. And it can make the crisis spread. And there was lots of, there were capital controls in Cyprus eventually to sort of prevent things from spreading and people taking their money away from Cyprus. <coughs> and so for that reason, there is a need to know somebody who's, bo who's bought bonds issued by a bank in Cyprus. Can, they, can those bonds be converted into equity in some future crisis? And if that is the case, then sort of that affects the value of that bond. And it should be taken into account by, by capital markets. So for those reasons, I think it's, it's very important to have sort of clear rules on how the, resolu the resolution of a banking crisis is going to be made, A. And B, I think it's important, it sounded a bit like what Thorsten and maybe Nicola said, that, well, it, it won't solve this crisis anyway, but so that we could soon come into a situation where either debt write-down is, it's obvious that we need it quickly, or some country decides to leave the common currency or something, I mean, something that creates a new situation similar to what we experience in Cyprus. And then we will need this clarity on how to solve the situation. So it will not become a, a matter of political nightly negotiations, because, I mean, that's, nobody knows how that, they are. I think the, the, your, your example of the Cyprus, I can really illustrate how important the resolu resolution framework is. Yeah. Um, I mean, because the situation in Cyprus was known for a long time. The, oh, sure. The, my, the, the dismal situation of the, of the Cypriotic banks. But, um, um, I mean, for political reasons, they wanted to wait until a new uh, government could come in and then they, they could actually talk to. Um, and it also shows the importance, again, to have the resolution on the, uh, on the Eurozone level. I mean, so, um, Nicolai has a very kind of optimistic view that uh, after the stress test and after the AQR, whose outcome we don't really know, um, there's at most one country that uh, <coughs> might need additional help um, um, to bail out its bank or to restructure its bank. Uh, if I understood correctly, you mentioned uh, uh, Portugal. Under current uh, market conditions. Well, that, that's actually my second point, is that, well, it's, it, for me it's a little bit of a risky game to say, well, let's, it's a little bit of a kind of economist view, sorry, I'm being a little bit cynical, but let's assume the market condition hold as they are right now. Um, I mean, it's, uh, we've postponed the, the resolution of the crisis already too long. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the reasons that actually people at the IMF tell me that uh, they didn't want to intervene too much into Greece in 2009 is because they want to get better market conditions. Um, uh, well, you don't know whether you're going to have the same market condition at the end of the year. I mean, there might new shocks come in, and then they might hit at the same time as the results of the AQR and stress test. And then you might be in a situation where it's not one country, it's only several countries whose, whose banks are just too big for the country to actually be restructured, to be bailed out under, current, uh, under the new uh, market conditions then. And then, then we, we have a new crisis at hand. And uh, of course, then you have the feedback effect again, uh, saying, well, what will the ECB do? Will the ECB really point to the banks that are weak? 
um, knowing that the countries will not be able to actually restructuring them, uh, restructure them because they don't have the resources? <coughs> or will they rather say, um, well, you know what, uh, let's, let's twist a little bit the assumption so it doesn't look as bad, which of course would then undermine the, um, the reputation from the very start of the, of the SSM, of the, of the ECB. So in November, ECB can actually choose between actually undermining the whole system or uh, maybe plunging Europe back into a new crisis. Is that that could be the worst case scenario? Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, yeah, yeah. you don't know the future. You know? I think you know if you reveal the losses in the banking system, you don't invent those losses. So the, yes. the losses are there. You just yes. reveal them. Yes. And it's painful. It's like you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a surgical procedure, right? Uh, it's painful. But if you do nothing, it's probably worse, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there are incentives to delay it, and we have done that for five years. I couldn't agree more with what had been said that we have waited too much. I mean, we should have tackled this situation in the banking sector in 2009. It's very clear. And it's not for lack of advice. I mean, I've, uh, I'm not quoting myself here. If you look at what the IMF was saying at the time, it was very explicit in the fact that the banking problem hadn't been addressed and there was a need for this process of triage, re recapitalization, and restructuring. So uh, I think it's very good that the AQR is doing it. I think it's the good news of uh, the last two years. Uh, and I think it has to be recognized for what it is, which is better late than uh, never. Uh, now, now, what if the market conditions become worse in the course of the year? And I've mentioned, you know, Iran, China, you can think of any sort of bad scenario, exogenous to the EU or endogenous. Um, and, um, and, and this is a possibility. But well, in that case, you know, you will have to deal with uh, the feedback loop again. And the ESM will probably need to intervene. And you will have new political facts on the ground in terms of what is Germany uh, as a, the pivotal player really uh, willing to do. So I, I think you know, we are, we're in an uncertain world, but I certainly wouldn't say uh, it wasn't a good idea to launch the AQR because there is this uncertainty about market conditions. I would say exactly the opposite. I think the launch of the banking union and AQR has contributed to the improvement of market conditions very powerfully. And even if market conditions were to worsen in the course of the year, it would still be worse doing the AQR and doing it rigorously, and I think that's the view of the ECB. But uh, should we say a question there soon? Okay. Uh, maybe we should say something a bit about the stress tests and explain them. And uh, Because the, the last round of stress tests, uh, was that two or three years ago? Um, the, the, the calculation was that the government could never go bust. So you could actually calculate that government bonds were risk-free. Uh, Will it be the same this time? And if so, is there any point to a stress test? Anyone? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Well, A, yes, there is, of course. I mean, a stress test, it means that somebody, the regulator in this case, makes a sort of nightmare scenario. What's the worst thing that can happen to this bank in terms of falling asset prices, in terms of bad interest rate margins? Uh, a, and B, does the bank have capital enough to solve these, to, to cover these losses? Uh, and it raises a couple of questions of why, one, what is this nightmare scenario? Or how bad can things get? And when the EBA made the stress tests earlier, they considered sovereign bonds safe. So they sort of took it for granted that if a government bond cannot fall in value. And that was some sort of political consideration and it's obviously wrong. I mean, we have seen that that can happen. So that's one of the things. So you have to have, make it realistic, and of course the, the ECB can do that. But and, and, and then there is another, I, which is, I guess is an accounting issue. It was in the Financial Times this morning that the German banks are looking over their shipping yeah. lending. They have large shipping portfolios. Say a bank lends 50 million euros to shipping. And then comes a crisis, and the world trade goes down. Uh, historic cost accounting was leading to more stability. So the opposite is true, exactly for the reasons that Per just said. So it has been a huge intellectual victory of banking lobbying, and I think, frankly, this was depressing, and we are slowly, slowly coming out of this. Why did the stress test fail in 2010, 2011? Not primarily because of the question of sovereign bond, just because the accounting was inaccurate, misleading, insincere, and probably in some cases fraudulent. And that was the case in Texas, it was the case in Irish banks, it was the case in a number of banks, including some that haven't had uh, obvious visible problems until now, 
but the accounting was unacceptable. So the question is, will the ECB be able to impose better discipline in this than the EBA was? And here my answer is unambiguously yes. I agree. That doesn't mean the stress test or comprehensive assessment or whatever you call it, AQR, this year will be a success because the bar is quite high. It's a difficult thing to succeed on. But I think we can be very confident that it will be more successful than what had been done by the EBA. And by the way, I'm not criticizing the staff of the EBA, which really did the best they could. But they had a very weak institutional and governance structure to work with. They had no resources. They had no authority. They had no leverage. So ECB has resources. It has authority. It has leverage. So it will do better. And it has committed itself very strongly to succeeding with this. A question from the floor. Uh, I would like to see a niche for local banking in in the bank union, but of course, uh, small local, be it corporate or be it uh, savings banks like in Germany. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why we've seen this, uh, this consolidation, uh, both within countries and across countries, is because there was this uh, uh, too big to fail premium uh, to get for the, uh, for, by these large banks. I mean, that's why they, 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 there's probably big reasons behind this uh, consolidation trend. So I think that's
this crisis at all, really. Um, private debt has not been decreased uh, during this crisis. We haven't seen any deleveraging there. And public debt has increased during this time. The Commission thinks that 160% of GDP in private uh, market uh, debt is excessive. Well, that's about the average right now in the European Union. And countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, they're about 200%. We haven't even begun the uh, situation, didn't solve it, but uh, it, the crisis has sort of morphed from an acute crisis into a chronic crisis. Uh, we thought that households businesses, banks were dying late 2011, in the summer of 2012 again. The good news is that they did not die. But the bad news is that they all became zombies. Over leveraged, overstretched, with no room to consume, to invest, to hire, to expand and so on. And that is quite dangerous. So I would say that in conclusion to this day, from my side, I will uh, match the doom and gloom that has been uh, mentioned here. Actually, I'll see your three crises, the financial crisis, the euro crisis, the will be most interesting. A lot of people have talked about an Hamiltonian moment in European politics, sort of when we build the federal union by pooling uh, debts and so on. That's not what has happened here. We have not had a Hamiltonian moment. We might have had a Buenos Aires moment. That's my fear. Uh, because what ha Alexander Hamilton did in the US in the late 18th century was that he pooled the legacy debt, the old debt from the Revolutionary War, but they did not build up a, a pool of debt, they did not promise to bail states out and so on. And in fact, in the 1840s, the um, federal government let, I think, eight or nine different American states to fail because they were reckless with their finances and uh, they were allowed to fail. Which meant that they had to create a confidence in the markets in the future. And they did. And they started with their own internal budgetary processes, with different rules, uh, different ways of uh, making sure that they had balanced budgets and so on. And so they could return and borrow on the market. That's not what Buenos Aires did at the same time. When they had their crisis, what they did was that they bailed the states out. They just bailed them out and promised to do it again. So all states knew that they could do the same thing again, and it yep, happened again, and they were bailed out again. And that created a terrible legacy, a terrible legacy that meant that uh, they constantly uh, got into that kind uh, of problems in the future. And since 1900, Argentina has defaulted five times, and that's one of the reasons. And here, here's the question for Europe's future in European politics. What do you do when you began going down that road? If markets don't discipline countries, banks, and so on, then someone else has to. And right now it seems that Brussels and Berlin is the response to this question. And I find that dangerous. That's, that's dangerous uh, for Europe's future. Well, there are three big problems. First of all, how do you create any kind of confidence? We know from the last stability pact that whenever Germany and France wants to want to break the rules, they do that. But second of all, you often look at the wrong targets. You look at specific fiscal targets next year, rather than long-term growth, long-term structural reforms and so on. But the third difficulty is the most dangerous one, and that's why I'm worried and I'll raise you one crisis. Because it creates tensions and it creates hostility between nations. It's always difficult when your employer tells you, that I'm sorry you had to go, or you'll have to accept this, um, this cut in wages, or you won't get the kind of retirement that you've expected. But if you hear them say that this is the case because Germany tells me to, that's the very moment when we begin to, I think, ruin many of the parts of European cooperation and European harmony we have. So we have to get out of that somehow and get back to market disciplines rather than Brussels and Berlin. Yes, I realize I made a mistake. I should have made this session the political crisis. So we should have <laughs> crises all the way to the problem. <laughs> Katrina, what is, uh, what is the ambiance at the top meetings when you, when you attend uh, between uh, Germany and Greece, for example, and so on? Is it tense? I think I would like to uh, continue a little bit on okay. the on the yes. on the former question and, and come where where that will play into the yeah. uh, 
the analysis of the situa situation, the original question you posed, I think um, a lot of things have, have been done uh, to address the crisis, but obviously, as we have seen throughout today, today, a lot more needs to be done. But if you look at your different crises, which I think is an excellent way of structuring the discussion, if you look at the debt crisis, for example, a lot, a lot has actually been done there. You had um, a situation in, in need of uh, much more uh, uh, strict rules, and we have uh, accomplished a lot in that field. We have the fiscal compact, we have fiscal frameworks through the six-pack, through the two-pack. All of that has now um, uh, been adopted actually throughout Europe, and I think that is, that is uh, of course, a big uh, accomplishment, um, but what we are lacking in that field is the implementation, and we still see a situation where the average debt is over 90%, as also has been commented here today. So obviously, uh, we're not over that hurdle yet. Uh, in the banking union, a lot needs to be done. We've just started, because as has been said here, um, we had the SSM agreement, we had the SRM agreement, but the, the really crux of the matter is uh, once you have identified a failed bank, who is going to pay for that? And that's the fund that now is being uh, negotiated by this intergovernmental agreement. So that uh, it will be very interesting to see. And that will go very quickly, already in March. Um, the target is that we have, we should finish those negotiations, even though the build-up of the fund will take many years, of course. And so we finally see how that functions. Um, but the big thing where I think we still uh, need uh, to take many more steps uh, is where it comes to the growth, the discussion. What we really need now, when we get these, hopefully, structures into place, is also to create growth in Europe. And there, there are a lot of efforts which are quite um, easy to take, which will not burden uh, those uh, countries in crisis with high debts, where there are quite easily steps, low-hanging fruits, uh, uh, that could be taken. Uh, that are, of course, in the com completion of the single market. It's something we've been discussing uh, over uh, such a long time, but there are still uh, so many benefits that we are not realizing. Um, only if we look at the services sector, um, this was mentioned briefly before, but we forget that uh, 70 uh, to 80 percent of all EU production uh, in all EU countries, on an average, uh, the services sector accounts for 70 to 80 percent, while we have uh, um, and a cross-border situation where we have trade between EU countries only accounts for 25%. So if we could uh, increase the trade in services, we would have uh, big benefits for our GDP growth. Uh, we have a services directly that we're not implementing. We have this proportionality test, which basically allows us to have whatever national <coughs> regulation we want to, if we think they are in proportion to we deem necessary. We have regu regulated professions. So while all uh, new employment in Europe is created in the services sector, uh, we, don't, we do not uh, um, boost the trade in services. Uh, the same, we have a digital market uh, where we could um, actually in Germany, I read that the second biggest employer is in the ICT uh, internet sector. And I was looking at France, 20% of all uh, growth between 2004 and 2009 uh, has come from this sector, uh, but we don't have a common uh, digital market within the EU. If we are to compete with the American companies, which was also pointed out, we need to have a common first European market. We have the trade, almost all growth is coming from countries outside of uh, the EU. Uh, and we should, of course, benefit from this growth by trade agreements. We have the TTIP with the, with the U.S. right now that we're negotiating, which accounts for half of the world's GDP. Of course, if we have common rules and increase our trade there, would be an enormous benefit for, for our, our GDP growth. And uh, just to mention briefly two more areas, uh, female um, labor participation, uh, which is this fantastic potential we have in Europe that we do not make use of. Uh, as Birgitta Olsson was said, saying initially, we have the world's best educated housewives. Uh, and surveys say uh, 
15 to 20 percent of GDP growth, uh, this could lead to if we actually uh, not make just women be those that take the most university um, uh, degrees uh, in the EU, EU, but we also uh, actually uh, they would participate much more in the labor market. Um, so I think there are a number of things that are not costly uh, that we really could do. Uh, so I think if we continue on the banking union, we continue on this, um, uh, what more fiscal frameworks, stricter fiscal frameworks, and we then also invest on the EU level what we could do together to boost growth, uh, we could be a little bit more optimistic. Sounds quite optimistic. How about you, Pierre? Doom and gloom or optimism? I think, I think uh, well, I, I like quoting Cecilia Malmström, as you know, uh, Commissioner Malmström is worth quoting. Uh, and uh, she normally says optimism is a, is a duty, not a trait of character. I think it is not only uh, the fact that it is, it is a duty. There, there are, I think there are reasons to be, I would say, in a, in a measured way, uh, uh, optimistic about uh, 2014. I think, we, I think first to answer your question, let, let's, not be, let's not be a bit... To take, take some perspective and say, I mean, this has been, the, the crisis has been the, the, the heaviest test of political cohesion in the EU since the creation of the EU. No? <coughs> I think, that's, that, I think that, that's very clear. And at the end of the day, uh, we've come, we've come we're, still, we're still standing. We've come, uh, not through the crisis, because I don't think the crisis is over, but we are <laughs> still, uh, we are still uh, functioning. It is, uh, it's been a period where we have made big steps. And today, the, what the EU is today is in no way similar or in no way identical to what it was in 2008, 2009. So the EU has evolved with the crisis. Now, we would have liked to see it evolve quicker from the European Commission. Uh, there are some issues which are still uh, on the agenda, but as such, it has come out as a, at least at this stage, as a, as a stronger actor than it was in 2008, 2009. Why are there reasons to be slightly optimistic? The, uh, I mean, the figures, the figures are, are, are there and do point to, uh, to an improvement. I mean, we had, we've seen growth since the second quarter of 2013 at low levels, but nonetheless growth. 2014 looks better. State finances are in better order. We're not surprised by the fact that public debt uh, are at the levels that we we, we were we, we knew they would continue to increase in 2012 2013. What we see is that they might in this year peak, and that and, and that there are there are prospects for it to turn slowly downwards uh, later on. Uh, so the state finances are looking in a better shape, and economic sentiment has clearly improved in Europe, and we are now at the long term average of economic uh, sentiment indicators. That's a good sign. Industrial production, we got the figures today from Eurostat in November, jumped 3% upwards uh, in November. All of these are, are good signs, which, which, as I said, does not put us in a situation where we can be, uh, say, say the crisis in any way is over, uh, but, uh, but at least allow us to have some uh, positive view on 2014. What needs to be done, of course, the labor market, it is our main concern for the moment, that's clear. With 27 million people unemployed, one cannot reasonably argue the crisis is over. The labour market, and linked to that, of course, lending to the real economy, is for me, uh, it's, it's made, from our perspective, uh, one of the main bottlenecks uh, for the moment. The banking union comes into that, but I agree at the later phase. Today, what we need to, uh, to be doing is creating a, a, a structure where lending to the real economy takes some, uh, takes some, uh, some speed and uh, allows mainly for the SMEs to finance uh, investments in SMEs. We have stories of SMEs coming with orders, not being able to take loans. Uh, clearly, the banks are very, very careful in the loans, and that, I think, is, a, is, a, is an issue. So from that perspective, yeah, uh, that allows us to, be, to look at 2014 as a year where the European economy is gathering speed. It's not up to speed. It is not, uh, it is not uh, at a stage where it should be, but it's gathering speed. We have growth in all countries, in all EU countries, at least according to the projections, except Cyprus and, uh, and Slovenia in, in 2014, which then growth in our projections at least, taking some more speed in 2000, 2015. Isn't that sort of a paradox here? Because we have, we have a crisis now that started off with a lot of bad loans. Yeah. Now you say that what we need now is more lending. Uh, what if we have another downturn in five years or so? I mean, we'll have another downturn soon enough, um, sooner or later. 
Uh, yeah. We have even more, I mean, we have really low interest rates now and we have a rebound maybe in the economy, people start lending more. Oh, well, we have an even bigger problem in five years. So? No, I mean, I think, I think one, of the main re one of the reasons of the crisis, not the only one, but is a misallocation of lending over the first 10, ten years of, uh, of, of the euro brought about by, by, by erroneous policies uh, and incentives structures in, in many of our member states. This is a different for form of uh, lending we're talking about. This is lending towards companies that actually have a potential to grow and that have, that have, that have, a, 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 that have a, a job creating potential. How do, you know, how do we know that the money ends up there? I mean, you, can, you can have another yeah. housing bubble. Listen, I mean, we, we, clearly today, the financial market is more fragmented than it was before the crisis. Yeah. And clearly, banks uh, are, are very cautious, some would say overly cautious, yeah. in lending out money to the, to the real economy. Someone else's word about the new bubble? No? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> one of the problems is that we don't know which ones are the good companies or the bad companies. That's something we have to find out on the market. Right now, some, according to the IMF, some 30% of the business loans in Italy go to Italian companies that cannot pay the interest on those loans with any kind of profit. Um, they're, in a way, destroying capital to keep businesses afloat. We're very, very bad at killing off bad companies and bad banks in Europe, um, which is always a drag on growth and on the new opportunities. So we must somehow separate them. And I'm, I think that this excessive uh, period of incredibly low interest rates, I mean, not just in, in Europe, in the US, all over the world, has also <coughs> meant, and IMF has warned about this, that there's much less of due diligence than it has been before, more exotic places that investors are looking for any kind of returns because just uh, saving money is not, not worth anything at all. And that makes it much more important to make sure that we, in that case, identify the, the losses, the problems, the bad banks, the bad business, and allow them to fail. And this is not just a political issue. It is partly. We've got worse uh, bankruptcy laws in many countries, even though they are being reformed. We have a more hostile situation to uh, debtors than US, for example. But I think it's also about, uh, about culture. And this should be the very moment when we begin to change that kind of culture and realize that just defaulting and starting all over again as a household, as a business, as a country, is not the worst thing you can do. It's often much better than just continuing but without any kind of energy, without any kind of resources to, to expand. You want also point out, to, firstly, uh, that uh, in US they have a no bailout rule for the, for the states, uh, which actually the Eurozone had as well, already from the, from the beginning. But uh, the difference is that in, in the US they have actually kept this and not really in the Eurozone. Uh, can can there be, is it possible to build a trust again that we won't bail out member states or what will happen in the future? Can we build a system like that where we don't bail out member states? Well, I think that that's exactly what the rules we have been adopting now during the crisis the last <coughs> couple of um, years has aimed at we will uh, take a lot of steps earlier. We have now sanctions more gradual at an earlier stage. We have macroeconomic surveillance, the whole warning system, so, so to say, have been built up so we don't have a, an, um, without any pre-warning, a, a new uh, crisis. But this, this should be, um, one should be able to see, see this coming. The Commission makes country-specific <coughs> recommendations. Uh, we have the European semester. We have a completely different si system, I would say, uh, than we had before the crisis. I think, I think the essential, the big difference in, uh, in a whole governance structure is that before the crisis, assessments, recommendations were essentially ex post. Now they come at an ex ante uh, moment in evaluating macroeconomics, in eva evaluating state finances in a completely different matter than, uh, than before, for instance, the decision on the two-pack for the euro countries, not for Sweden but to evaluate national budgets before they are <coughs> taken by national parliaments. So there's a complete different shift in the surveillance from an assessment of what, what has happened to 
recommendations, guidelines to what should be done before it happens. I think that's, that, that is one big difference. I think the interesting thing with the no bailout was that for, the, for 10 years, for, from the 10 year first years of the creation of the euro, the market seemed to assume that there was a bailout. Yes. Yeah? So because when you see the, the, the way the interest rates moved uh, after, for instance, Greece entered the eurozone, uh, I mean, the difference with the, the German interest rate was marginal. So they, the market seemed to assume that there was a, a bailout system in the EU, while, as you said, it was clearly written in the treaty that there wasn't. Yeah? Uh, and that, of course, put it in a position where also we have to recognize that in the future we, we will have to see uh, these, these, are, these are two twin principles, increased control, increased solidarity. And that's, these are the two principles where whole cri the whole crisis management is based on, that there is increased surveillance, increased, from that perspective, discipline, at the European level, and when that is in place, there is a possibility also to, to see what kind of solidarity can be exerted at European level. I think the, the problem from the beginning was that there was a ba no bailout clause. No. Uh, the market didn't trust it because all the other the wrong signals were sent uh, from all the authorities and from the European Central Bank as well. They uh, said from the start that all these uh, sovereign bonds will be treated equally like collateral. We won't have any difference in as assessment. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, the president of the European Central Bank, said in 2005 triumphantly, publicly, that look at the yields on different, public, on different sovereign debt. Uh, there are no local risk factors included in the market assessment anymore. So the euro has triumphed. We are now seen as being in the same boat. So that was clearly one of the uh, things, one of the signals that they wanted to send. And of course, that many countries uh, used as an argument to join the euro from, from the start. And the problem today is that the market interprets these signals in exactly the same way. A no bailout clause now would be completely uncredible since all these arguments about this super surveillance are being used as a way of saying that, look, since we're in the same boat, we'll have to take care of the public finances. Well, why would you have to do that if you really would never bail out a country that was reckless with its public finances? Then you would just say to, like Gerald Ford, well, he didn't really say it, but according to one newspaper interpreter, said, President Ford to New York City, drop dead. It's not really our concern. Um, and, and, and all these different pacts is really a way of upholding some discipline when the market thinks that there is a, in a way, an internal bailout promise for, for other countries. I don't know. I don't know about that. The, uh, but anyway, the, I think the, I think the, the discussion we, uh, we've had is, is based on the, on the notion that with moving uh, forward with strengthening economic policy coordination at the national level and strengthening fiscal uh, surveillance at national level. From that perspective, uh, we put ourselves in a situation where clearly it has had some result. State finances, as I said, are in considerably better shape in terms of budget deficit. And from that perspective, from when you see that, you also have to see what kind of solidarity you, ha you have to exert. That is a logical step, as we see it at least, in strengthening, uh, in strengthening EMU, and that that process, I think, will will uh, will continue and continue in that direction. Uh, I think we will see more coming from that. I mean, uh, the EMU construction, what has been done now with the banking union, this is a, this is a very big step. I think it can be argued. I would share many of the things said before here. I think it can be argued is one of the major steps of economic integration taken since the creation of EMU uh, in Europe. Uh, but there are other things that uh, are clearly spelled out. And it will be on the agenda. The the process of, of strengthening EMU will continue. But there is now uh, a, a decrease in trust in politicians generally in Europe, not in Sweden, but generally in Europe. Uh, definitely a decrease in trust in in the European Union. Uh, what should be done? What could be done about this? Isn't that a problem right now in the crisis management? In a way, it's a business cycle phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's got to be said. Um, belief, trust in politicians and in businesses and in banks, they rise and fall with, with what's going on um, in the economy with the kind of promises that have not been kept and so on. 
But there is a bigger problem and a bigger long-term problem, and that is that many of the things that were being said about the uh, European project have not really been upheld by by politicians. They constantly, during the crisis, and that often happens, you constantly shift and change and, and so on, but it has been taken to extremes I, in, in the way uh, the Germans were promised that they would never uh, have to bail out another country and then they feel like uh, they misbehaved and we have to bail them out. Uh, many populations in southern Europe were promised in a way low interest rates and then suddenly that this comes with new new harsh uh, rules and, uh, and surveillances. So I think that there's got to be, I mean it's not a one-way street this trust thing. You have to uh, give no more promises than you can keep. And then you have to stay uh, on the course, in a way. And I, I think that's, that's the only way to, to regain <coughs> some of that trust. Yeah. No, I, I think it's definitely a big problem. And, and uh, of course, we're all waiting for the European elections and see what, what parties <coughs> will uh, um, gain votes there. And we, we, as has been discussed, we, we are very worried that the extremist uh, uh, parties will I was just reading that in France, I mean, probably uh, the Front National will, uh, might be the biggest party in the European elections in France. And of course, we will have a completely different European Parliament. Uh, um, we heard that in uh, the Netherlands, 40% probably will be taken by the extremist uh, parties from the left and from the right. So, of course, this is extremely worrying. I think. There is, as also in the first session was discussed, if you have a long protracted economic crisis and all the hardship that the populations have gone through with unemployment uh, and the social welfare systems of being weakened and so, it is natural. It's not just a protest against national governments, it's protest, protest against the European structures since a lot of decisions are also taken within uh, the EU, it's, it's quite an, uh, a natural reaction, and that's something we have to, that's why we're doing all this, we are doing, uh, we're addressing the debt crisis, the banking crisis, uh, the, the financial crisis, so we can turn this hopefully around. But I think there's also a different, um, you said that um, maybe the fourth crisis is the political crisis. I think there is, there is also this, um, um, the democratic, Structure. We need a little bit to look into how the decisions uh, in Brussels are anchored in national parliaments. I think that is that is a very uh, important uh, discussion. Even when things are being decided very quickly, when things in a crisis go very fast, I think it's extremely um, important that you have the discussion and the anchoring in the national parliaments, in the national debate, uh, because uh, otherwise you haven't anchored very difficult decisions among the population, and uh, if things are going too quick, only afterwards uh, citizens realize what are the, are the decisions taken. For example, I think we, we have, uh, in, in many of the Nordics country, good, uh, good systems where the minister has to go to parliament and say, this is what will happen in Brussels, these are the positions I will take, and he or she must have a mandate. But this is not happening uh, all over Europe, and I think that those kind of discussions are very important to have. I think, it's, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it is the main question, the political trust. Uh, I think it is an, an issue that clearly is keeping, is highest on our, on our, on our mind, uh, and it is, it, it is extremely worrying. Uh, and I think I don't think it's a distancing as such towards the EU or European institutions or about national governments. It's a distancing towards politics in general. Uh, actually, if you see the figures, uh, it, it, it's touching national governments even more than EU institutions. But that's not the point. It's not the point about who is more uh, affected by the, the lack of trust. It's a lack, there, there is a lack, there's a, there's a decreasing support, decreasing, decreasing trust in politics in Europe. And that's not a good sign. That's, not, that's, that's a very worrying aspect, uh, which, which means, of course, that the way it, it touches the EU institutions is that this difference, this dividing line that existed before the crisis between what is a European issue and what is a national issue has disappeared and will not come back, by the way. Yeah? So the dividing line between national politics, European politics has largely disappeared. Uh, 
national politics has become European politics and vice versa. And from that perspective, it means that the EU institutions get into the national debate, the dirty national debate, in a completely different way than it used to before the crisis. Where we could keep to issues of trade policy, of uh, internal market, it sounded fine and so forth, and nobody really understood. But now we are getting into discussions about labor market rules, about uh, about fiscal policy and economic policy. And people care about that, and therefore we become a part of that debate, the national debate, in a completely different way than before. The uh, yeah, I mean, I would largely, uh, I don't know exactly what the solution is to that, but clearly uh, any form of further step towards, I don't think the banking union as such is such a big issue in that perspective, but w any further step towards what we call fiscal union, which is, should not be misunderstood as taxation union. In the Swedish context, uh, people often misunderstand as a taxation union. It's more a kind of budgetary policy union, uh, economic policy union, needs to go hand in hand, and this is what we've, we've been arguing, with uh, stronger political and democratic account accountability. Can I just relate that to something that was said earlier today? Because I, re I definitely agree with the economist's perspective that, look, we've given so much generous advice on how to solve this crisis. I think Hans uh, pointed this out. But for some reason, everything is being seen as politically impossible. And I really share that frustration in so many ways. But this is really comes down to this matter of trust and the, how you anchor uh, different uh, perspectives in the, in the population as well. Um, I agree that I can't see any way of dealing with the sovereign debt of several countries without a substantial debt write-down. But uh, a few people said here on the stage earlier today, let's see if ECB can fix this in some way and uh, hope that no one will really notice what's going on and whatever happened to those debts. And I can share that uh, uh, assessment as well. But I think that would be the most dangerous thing that could happen, because that would dip, ex play into exactly this populist narrative of Europe right now, how there is a big plan that someone has there, they wanted to go there all along, now they have their crisis and their moment, and they will shove this down our throats and they don't even tell us what is going on. But that's incredibly dangerous, and that's the thing that will make these extreme parties uh, uh, successful in, in elections for years to come, in a way, and I really think that politicians have to stick their neck out, talk about what they're doing, and, and really argue in favor of it, because I don't think that all these things are politically impossible. Uh, and, and I think that that's part of the frustration as well, that some things are just being said, Oh, yeah, sure, we would want an integrated service market or something, but that'll just fail. No, from that perspective, to continue that argument, I think the, what the, the stage we are in now, uh, what is, I think what is very important is that the political uh, arena is actually occupied by many different forms of actors. And what we, what we risk seeing in many member states is a tendency by established parties to try to withdraw from this issue. I'm not saying it's, this is the case of Sweden. Um, I'm looking at the European level more, more generally, that where there would be an interest for, whether from the left or from the right, established parties not to engage in that debate, especially in view of the EP elections. If that happens, then we are in for, then we are in for deep trouble. Uh, not to say something else, uh, in the, uh, of this year in the, uh, in the elections, because then, then different forms of, different forms of populistic, you may call, you what, call them what you, what you want, uh, movements will dominate the debate for the European elections. Uh, one of the reasons for forming the Euro uh, was uh, to unite Europe more. And uh, what we've seen now is uh, Greeks calling uh, Germans Nazis and uh, Germans calling Greeks lazy and so on. Uh, what is happening to the cohesion in the Union? Uh, is, this, is this something temporary? W will it be better again in five years or do we have a real problem here? Or maybe the question is, what would have happened without the EU structures? And I, my, my, my notion would be, or my, my assessment would be that, uh, as Johan was started saying, uh, it is the kind of common European institutions, and I count the member states in that as well, no? uh, to the Council, that have, uh, that have uh, made sure that while, while you have these kinds of rhetoric debates, I don't, I'm not sure that you should attach such strong importance that rhetoric debate, while, while you have these, these statements that are unacceptable, uh, broadly speaking, the House has been kept together in terms of uh, the established rules, the established regulations, the established form of economic cooperation, broadly speaking, it's been kept together. 
Let us think, I think, has been a result of the fact that uh, it is a, a union based on uh, a set of rules and laws, which backed up by institutions and a political commitment. What do you say, Katharina? Uh, I gave you the question earlier. Mm. You, no, since I, you, you are at those political meetings, uh, you are, we should explain to people, you often do the negotiations for the Prime Minister, don't you? Uh, when he can't come to meet himself. So, uh, what's... No, I, I think, I, I don't, of course, we, we read all these and, and those statements are, of course, uh, unacceptable, but I think when, when countries are trying to find solutions in Brussels together, we we more or less share the same um, analysis of the problems. Uh, then there are different views on how we should uh, address the problems, and uh, there are a lot of discussions about that, but there is you know, a deep um, sense of shared uh, responsibility for the problems and for the problem solving. Uh, and I also, I mean, as was mentioned before here today, <coughs> the Euro has, uh, the support for Europe in Greece has actually increased, so that uh, underscores also what, what Pierre said about the alternatives. So uh, I think um, the positive side that there is a common will to overcome these problems, the, the different views and solutions may differ, but uh, there continues to be this common will to, to find the right solution. I think I'm more fearful, uh, in a way. I think there's a reason why we want, apart from all the economical reasons, there is a reason why we want anonymous markets to punish misbehaving countries with higher bond yields, rather than a public official from another country. Or at least an anonymous IMF official, so that people can say, oh, it's all the IMF's <laughs> fault, because no one really understands what that is. But when they begin to think that this is the Germans' fault, or the Spanish or the, the, the Greek population or something like that. It ties into old national resentments that are incredibly dangerous. And that's an even more important argument, I think, for why we should go back to a market discipline of uh, sovereign debt and, uh, and, and uh, assessments of future growth, rather than having this as politicized uh, Brussels uh, institutions. Actually, we're almost running out of time. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Short questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. not, it's I, I, I'm intrigued uh, at how much of the debate has been about. One second, you get a microphone oh, so you can get on. Um, I'm intrigued that how much of this debate has been about the no bailout clause and the, this issue of market discipline that uh, you have, uh, both of you actually have uh, addressed uh, in many ways. And my question is, what's the market discipline? I mean, okay, uh, there was market discipline and there still is for U.S. states, but the U.S. government has a federal budget, right? No such thing in the EU. So banks have a common collateral and that's U.S. treasuries. They don't use uh, California bonds or Texas bonds as collateral. So, so if you have a, an integrated, developed financial system in Europe, do you really believe it can be built on uh, market discipline without a central... Uh, reference of collateral and uh, central budget? Well, first of all, the American states do have their own uh, budgetary rules that are quite important to make this work. But it's true that there's a different situation in the US. That's partly because it is a transfer union. They have, uh, they uh, share a lot of the taxes, the natural buffers, the budget, and so on with, with other states. But that took them 150 years from the Hamiltonian moment to do that. I'm saying that if you have that kind of system, then you would get away with that kind of pooling of, of debt and uh, the same kind of, basically the same kind of heels. But that's incredibly difficult. It took them 150 years, and they most, mostly at least were a homogenous population with the same language, this, uh, with the same kind of uh, view of their history, how they became a nation, and so on, trying to combine these different European nations into that same kind of framework, I fear might create more hostility than it would create uh, 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 sympathy. And, for, and more than that, it took them 150 years. It's dangerous to try to rush these things. Okay, we have to actually stop here. So I should stop with a super short poll with the ones who have been involved today. So in, in five years from now, will we, will we say that the Europe is out of the crisis? <laughs>
Philip, which of the four crises? <laughs> Are we? Yeah, <laughs> which crisis? That's the answer. Harald, what do you think? No? Partially. Partially. Pai? No. Nicola? No. Hans? No. <laughs> <laughs> On stage here, Pai? Oh, I think the existential crisis on the on the euro. I think yes, and that is behind us. I think will there be will there be economic issues, structural issues, still to be solved in five years' time? Yeah, of course, there will. But the crisis, yes. I would say partly. Partly, I think this is a chronic crisis. A chronic crisis. Okay, so we we start in doom and gloom, and we end in doom and gloom. Sorry for that. Um, thank you all for coming here. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, Swedish representation and okay, for letting us use this venue. Thanks to all my colleagues and everyone working here. So. Don't forget to take the books on the way out. Don't forget to take books on the way out. Buy the books that you should buy and take the others. <laughs> Thank you.